Welcome to season 13 of the Parenting Aces podcast, a proud member of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and this week I have the pleasure of speaking with a longtime Parenting Aces parent. He has a son and a daughter, twins, that are headed to college this fall, and they have taken two slightly different pathways, but Dad, Anurban Duda, is here to share his experience parenting these kids through their tennis journey into college tennis and has just a wealth of information to share with you guys. Just to give you a little bit of background, Anurban grew up in India and grew up as a tennis player representing his country on Davis Cup. He came to the States to play college tennis, so he is a very accomplished player himself, tried his hand on the pro tour after college and made his way back onto the coaching side before coming to Dallas, settling down, starting a family and becoming coach to his two kids as they started their tennis journeys. So I'm excited for you guys to hear from Honorbon and I hope you'll be sure to check out the show notes because there's some good information in there that is too much to talk about in the podcast itself, but um, some really good reference points for you guys as you're going through this journey with your own children. So sit back, relax, enjoy my conversation with coach slash dad slash Parenting Aces follower, Honor Banduta. So much fun to have a tennis parent on the podcast and especially one who I've interacted with so many different ways, whether it's on the phone, through Facebook, um, now on Zoom, Honor Banduta, it is so nice to see you and have you on and i'm really excited for you to share your tennis parenting journey with us but also your kids junior tennis journey on their route into college tennis so welcome sure well thanks for having me of course of course so like i do with all first-time guests i would love for you to give our audience a little bit of your tennis background how you got started in the sport your, how far you took tennis yourself and where you are in the sport right now. Uh, sure. So, you know, I played tennis growing up in India, in actually in, in Calcutta, India. So we played, uh, played in a, growing up playing in a club called South Club, which had a really big tennis tradition at that time. So, you know, Leander Pace, who just got inducted into the Tennis Hall of Fame. So, you know, he was there. He was two years older to me. So there we all kind of played in that same club. So the club has produced a lot of uh, Davis Cup players over time and it was one of the very few clubs which had uh, grass, clay, and hard, you know, so all three surfaces. So I played there. Um, you know, I was part of the Indian junior tennis team, uh, you know, kind of progressed along. And then eventually I ended up playing college. So I played, um, actually played uh, D1 and D2 college. I came to a D2 college and then I transferred out and I ended up playing a D1 college. I um, uh, post-college, I continued to play a little bit. You know, I didn't have the skill nor the talent, but I had the desire. So I went to Germany and, um, you know, in Germany, as you probably are familiar with your guests, right, there's the league system. So there's, yeah. a, you know, there's, a, you know, Bundesliga, Regionalliga, Oberliga. So Oberliga is the third division league, but it was pretty strong. You know, I would say that's probably more like mid-major college level at that time, maybe even some higher college players. So I played for Nuremberg, uh, you know, for a couple of seasons. And then, you know, I realized that tennis, playing tennis is probably not the way for me to monetize and go in life. But I had a, a degree in computer science, and then I kind of switched field, moved to Dallas. I started working in technology, but I was teaching tennis, um, you know, while I was doing it. So, you know, I first part, I was in Chicago. I taught at Midtown Tennis Club. Um, I was in the junior program. I was one of the pros. And, uh, you know, that program was at that time very thriving. You know, like Midtown has changed now a little bit. It's become more of a hotel. But at that time, it was very, um, very active tennis. So we had Donald Young, Spencer Vegosan, Laura Granville. They were all part of the program. Um, you know, I was not coaching them personally, but I was, you know, I was a group coach. So I traveled with them a little bit and stuff like that. Then I moved to Dallas. And, you know, while I was working with IBM, I was also coaching at that time, um, at Four Seasons, uh, the Four Seasons Hotel. And then I worked at a little bit at a, at a country club here called Canyon Creek. So this is kind of like, you know, how my sort of the tennis journey happened, like, you know, uh, before the kids were born. 
And after the kids were born and they started playing, so I kind of introduced them to tennis. They started playing. Then um, I was not coaching as much because I was really working with them more, I would say, as a supplementary coach, probably in the last like 15, 16 years. Mm -hmm. Did your parents play tennis? Is that why no, you got introduced no, they did to the not sport? Play. No, no, I played, you know, they, they they tried a few different sports for me and I really like soccer and tennis and kind of stuck to tennis. I love it. I love it. And so let's transition into, you mentioned you have two kids, they're twins mm -hmm. and they are finishing high, or have finished high school or heading to college in the fall. But I really want to focus this conversation around their journey and your journey as their parent, taking sure. them to the level where they both got recruited to play at very good colleges. And um, you've got a boy and a girl. So, I, I mean, you're the perfect guy to talk to. This is just great. I'm excited. Sure. So, um, you know, they started playing tennis in Dallas. So they played at different places, like, you know, as far as the group lessons were concerned when they were very young. So I was working with them like kind of like, you know, one on one. And, you know, they are more amenable to working with the parent when they're young versus when they get like the teens and the late teens. But they played early on. They played a little bit at Brookhaven Country Club in their program. You know, they played a little bit at High Point. And then probably about when they were like eight or nine years old, uh, the Taylor Dent family moved to Dallas. So mm -hmm. I I um I invested in their club, uh, you know, when they when they built the club and then the kids played there for I would say probably from then till about 15, 16, like the majority of the time, like, you know, they were, so that's sort of the journey that they played. Um, as far as their their journey is concerned uh, early on, I mean, you know, we were doing the same thing what most US players do, right? Like they were playing the little Mo. I mean, my, my daughter actually reached the finals in the nationals one year. I forgot it was either nine or eight, but they were playing little Mo. Then they were playing the USTA, you know, the USTA system. And Texas has a, had a little bit different system at that time. They mm -hmm. had that Texas, what they called was like a tiered system, like a uh, champs, super champs. And then they had ZAT. So ZAT, champs and super champs. So, so it was a little bit different than the national system. Now everybody is under the same pool. So they kind of actively played all that, I would say, till their... 12, 12 years old. Okay. Yeah. And, and at that point, I mean, obviously they started much younger than age eight, if they were already playing little Mo by that time, but let's, let's talk about those early years. How many days a week were they playing when they first started out? Was it groups? Was it private lessons? Was it a combination? And what was your role versus an outside coach, a non-parent coach in helping so, them at the beginning? So early years, they probably did not have an outside coach. I was working with them a lot, but I was probably, you know, and, and I've seen uh, different variations now. I've kind of seen what people say is the right thing to do, but the ones that are successful, what they actually do is a little bit different, you know, so I've, <laughs> and we can, we, we can cover some of that later. Yeah. But um, so I was working a lot one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one -on -one pretty much every day, but not for a lot, right? Like the duration would probably be about, you know, when they're really young, like maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes, right? But just trying to work on the fundamentals, you know, work with, you know, softer balls, just more like hand feet drills, things like that. So I was working a lot of that and as they started, like, you know, when they were like, you know, 10 and under at that time, they started playing in different groups, but they were not like every day or maybe they were like, you know, um, like three times a week or something. But those were more primarily we were looking at those for socialization rather than like tennis development because, you know, they were having a little bit fun. They were kind of like, you know, playing on mini tennis courts and things like that. And were they playing other sports as well, or was it all tennis all the time? No, we tried them a variety of sport, actually. You know, we tried soccer, we tried taekwondo, we tried swimming, you know, we, we tried a little bit of gymnastics. We tried a variety of sports, but they never quite really took the other sport as much. But maybe also the reason is because they were playing more tennis than everything else at the time. So they were they were getting a little bit more successful in tennis than than the other sports. So they probably veered towards that. Got it. And you you mentioned playing with the softer balls. Did you go through the red, orange, green, yellow progression as laid out by the governing body? Or did you kind of make it up as you went? No, I did not go through it. But what I did was, you know, I was doing like, 
you know, when they're really young, when they're five or six years old, right? Like, I mean, I think that ball's a very good tool because it helps you kind of build the consistency, build the rally. And, you know, if, I mean, if you're trying to have them, but so what I was doing was I was doing the drills. Like if you are calling about the feeding, the, the fed balls, mm -hmm. the fed balls with regular balls. So they start, you know, kind of, you know, building the racket speed and then they start like, you know, working on that because I can control the height, right? Where their point of contact is and maybe they don't get too extreme grips. But when they were doing the rallying and stuff, they were using, I probably would say I use more the green dot ball rather than the orange ball and the red ball because that was a little bit more realistic. They could go back to the court, but the balls were not coming at, you know, different weird angles for the live ball play. Got it. Got it. Okay. And so I know with the Texas system, um, there was an age restriction in terms of competing in yellow ball tournaments. Right. Were you looking for alternatives or were they competing in tournaments at all before they could play yellow ball? I mean, you know, they played. So in the Texas, I, I, I've forgotten the the exact age cutoff, but I think the youngest was nine, you know, that when you could start playing at that time, the yellow ball, the regular sanctioned tournaments, mm -hmm. but they were pretty good by that time. So they moved up from the, you know, there's a tiered level. They moved from the ZAT to the champs, to the super champs pretty quickly because they were playing a lot before. But as far as competing is concerned, I mean, you know, the they didn't really compete a lot. Like, I don't even know if they competed. Maybe they competed one tournament in the red ball, like the you know, in, in that age group, but they played the little more few years and, and they were just like kind of training. And then when they got uh, sort of ready to play or allowed to play those, the yellow ball tournament, they just moved straight to that. Okay. And when you say they weren't competing a lot, how many tournaments a year, like at age 10, were they playing? Do you remember? At age 10, probably now thinking back, they were playing way more than they probably should have because the way the system was is so every month they had something, you know, it's called a super champ tournament, right? And that kind of drove all the ranking and sort of, if I had to go back and do it, I'd probably cut down the number of tournaments that they played at that age, but focus more on the core building. But I would say probably they were playing at least one of those super champ tournaments a month. Okay. And was that the and only maybe, thing they'd be playing or they would play something else in addition? No, they, you know, so the Texas had that super champ. At that time, there was really, there were no national tournaments or anything they were playing the way the system was designed, but it was, they were playing the Texas super champ and then they had some of the lower level Texas tournaments that were in, da in Dallas area. So they would play those, you know, not every month, like, you know, religiously. So pro probably if you look at the whole year, they would probably play between 12 to 16 tournaments. Okay. And so that's in the, in the age of 10 and under as they moved yep. up to the, Oh, go ahead. They were playing under, so this was under 12s, but they were playing, they were 10 years old or nine and 10 years old, but they were playing under 12s. Yeah. Okay. And so as they got older, moved into age 12, 13, 14, what, how many tournaments at that point were they doing and were they starting to kind of branch out of Texas or at what point did you start branching outside of Texas? I mean, they did play the under 12. They played all the like, you know, like the super nationals, like, you know, what do you call, right? Like the hard national hard and the clay and, you know, the, the winter nationals and, 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 and all of those. So they played, they played those, they played the national tournaments. I mean, because they were qualifying and they were playing, but they were also playing the Texas tournaments at that point. So in Texas, I mean, you know, I mean, you had, everybody was really focused at that time. Like, you know, they, there was a really big deal for playing this tournament called the Texas Slam, right? Like that's kind of yeah. your uh, Bobby Curtis for the Texas. So everybody sort of played those, those really big ones, like, and then, and then the, probably the ones that were competing nationally, which they were, they would play some of the other, the, the higher super nationals where they got endorsed. Okay. And were they playing the junior orange bowl, Eddie Her, those types of events as well? They didn't play Eddie Herr, but they played the junior orange ball. So, you know, they were, so they played that, uh, you know, they played that two years, I think, you know, in under 12s. Okay. But at age 10, 11, 12, do you remember how old yeah, they like, were? Yeah, like when they were first eligible, I, I, I believe there was an eligibility cut you can play. Like, I believe it was 10, 10. So I think, I think they played like, you know, like 11 and then the 12th year. So they played two years, I remember, if I, if I recall it correctly. Okay. And... I want to talk about kind of their progression once they age out of the 12s, things are starting to 
get more serious as they get into the 14s, especially for the girls. So maybe let's let's split up and let's talk about Maya for a minute, and then let's talk about Jay, because the, their paths diverged a little bit as they started getting older, correct? Yeah, so, you know, what happened was, you know, uh, when they were around, I, I believe when they were around 13, 13 and a half, you know, COVID hit, right? So a lot of the things got changed for us forcibly. So pretty much for about a year and a half, two years, they were really not competing. We were lucky that we were in Texas, so they were able to train at that time, you know? Mm -hmm. But as far as the playing was concerned, like what happened was, like, you know, around 14 years old, like I'll I'll kind of pick from there because plus right before that was because of COVID. Yeah. So my, my I wanted Maya, and again, this is a choice and we can, you know, talk about it, but I wanted her to get the exposure to play some international tournaments. So she was not going to regular school or the kids were not there. They go to a public school or they went to a public school. That's, you know, that's basically you can, you can do it online, remote, right? Mm -hmm. So Texas has that. Most players use that over here. Um, so they could travel. So I wanted to expose her. So I would say probably at around 14 or so, she really kind of got off, not fully, but a lot from the USTF path and started playing uh, playing more ITFs, you know. So it, it actually gave her, she played her first clay court tournament in, uh, you know, in a, in a what's called a J30 now in Bolivia at that time. And it was a good experience because she was playing on red clay. She's never played on red clay. So, you know, people were sliding the South, the South Americans, like, you know, how they play, things like that. So those are obviously some of the experiences. So, but she kind of transitioned more towards playing um, the, um, the ITF. Mm -hmm. And then she played a few of those, the national, like the national hot courts because of the endorsement from the Texas. So she would just have enough points to get into the bigger ones and just play. But but primarily that's kind of the way we tried with both. Now she's, you know, and, but for him, we got a little bit like, you know, he was a little bit less successful. So it's a little bit different path, but he found his way in different ways. But for her, she was getting pretty good success to kind of navigate through and move up the rankings. And how did you determine that she needed to get on the ITF pathway and it was better for him to stay on the USTA pathway? I know you said, you know, the results, but was there something else that you were seeing, some intangible or was there a, a spoken desire by the kids about what they wanted to do? No, I did the I did actually the same thing for both the kids. So they both went the ITF route. I'm just saying that, you know, like she progressed like, like you know farther and probably faster than he did right Got but it. i um, i wanted to do the itf route for two reasons and you know a lot of time like you know people we talk with you know uh you know they always ask me this right like you know what you so either path it doesn't really matter i mean you know either path is good because there's multiple variables you know if you're doing itf i mean it's a commitment as far as you know money wise probably if you calculate it all like you know i mean what it costs to go play for a week in orange ball versus you know, you're going for a week in, I don't know, South America, you probably end up spending less, right? So it's not so much the money, but it's the time factor. It's a week-long tournament. You're going for at least two two to three weeks because the tournaments are stacked like that. So there's the, if the parent can travel with them or, you know, they can afford a coach to take them. So those factors are there. But I wanted them to play the ITS for two reasons. One, it kind of gives, at least in my opinion, and I came from India, so I've seen a lot of players playing ITF growing up. I played some ITFs growing up as well. So I am I was very familiar with that platform. I know a lot of coaches that travel in the ITF. It gives you a, an understanding of the, what a tour life is, right? Like, so whether the kid makes it or not, they understand it. They're playing on various surfaces. They're playing on various altitudes. They're kind of like traveling week by week. And it's like one and done. So, you know, I mean, you better be ready to go and play. So it gives a different type of environment. But again, it's not the same for everybody. But that we felt was the right fit for us to go that direction. Did they at that point express a desire to play professional tennis? Was that their goal? I mean, they, you know, initially when the kids play, their goal is always to play. Like they always say that you'd like to be a professional, right? So, I mean, yes, they did. They did absolutely, you know, set that desire. But it also gives, you know, I mean, you know, my son, while he started playing, he kind of realized like, okay, college is definitely a realistic path for him. You know, playing D1 is a realistic path, but probably, you know, making money as a pro, not so much, you know. 
with my daughter, I mean, I think, you know, she played for longer. She played the, you know, kind of the bigger events. So she kind of found out where, you know, where her strengths are, where her delta is. And if she decides to go that, what route she would take, you know, like, I think, I think she figured that, but that kind of gave it because when you're playing the USTA, a lot of times, you know, it's, it's, I think you get a lot of matches, you know, the, the upside is when you're playing like, you know, any of these tournaments, especially like, you know, you're, getting into consolation and sometimes in some of the bigger tournaments you can lose multiple times and still be in the tournament so from a match practice standpoint it's really really good right mm -hmm. you know um as far as mimicking what the pro pathway looks like it's not exactly the same you know because right. when you're going to this tournaments this itf tournaments i mean you know they have a physio i mean you know you're doing your activation you're doing your stretching you're going and you're kind of like gearing towards really playing one match now on the flip side you can go and you can prepare all you want and then you lose in the first match on first day and then the second match on doubles and then you're out the whole week. So that brings a different level of challenge as well. So it's kind of like, you know, there's there's pros and cons on both sides. What made you feel like that was the right choice for your kids? I mean, it's, you know, yes, they said they wanted to play pro tennis, but you said your son realized, you know, that, probably he wasn't going to be able to make a living doing that. And college was a more realistic pathway, but still the ITF circuit was kind of where you dove in. And I, you know, I'm just trying to, to help our listeners slash viewers understand how to make these decisions for your family. So, right. So I, I dove in for also for a, for a very different reason right so when you are raising kids you know my wife is you know my wife is american caucasian we live in the u.s we live in dallas you know i mean you know i would not say we are rich but you know i would say we are you know probably we are comfortable right so when yeah. they when you live in this lifestyle and playing tennis here you your friends and you have you bring a certain level of perspective something you know comes along when you start traveling to these type of countries in itfs you know you have to go through some life experiences which are hard to buy. So I wanted to make sure they um, they understand that. And I'll give you a couple of examples. I think it made them very self-sufficient because a lot of times we could not travel. I, you know, we remember very well this. I'll share with you one story. So Maya reached the, you know, Maya traveled with this travel coach. You know, there's some of these coaches that take a lot of players and then they travel. So there's a guy in Houston called Brent. I mean, you know, he does a good job. He very economical. He takes a lot of players and he travels to Central America, South America, but he has a lot of players, right? So Maya was playing this tournament and this was, I'll give you this example and you'll understand. She was playing, uh, she was there with Brent and a bunch of other players and she reached the finals. Now, a lot of the other players had were traveling from, you know, uh, from El Salvador to Guatemala the, because they had to play the qualies. Okay. Okay. In that group. So they had to go and sign in on Friday. At that time, you know, you had to, now I think ITF changed the rule. You can do virtual sign in, but at that time you had to go and physically sign in. So, mm -hmm. so everybody left. So now Maya is over there and that night, you know, she's, she's like, I don't know, she was like 15 or something. And she's in a hotel in downtown and it's not a great area. So by she herself. was by herself. What's that? She was by herself. No coach. That one night, right? Because yeah. everybody else left. So the yeah. coach had to leave with the rest of the players. So now she left. And then, you know, we were in Dallas and this kind of like all happened in the last two days, right? So so she plays the tournament. She loses in the finals, whatever. So the next morning she has to take a bus and the bus leaves at 5 a.m. Now, I don't know if you have ever been to these countries like, you know, Guatemala and Honduras and all these countries, no. but downtown, you know, where the buses are at the morning, you don't want to, you know, venture around too much there because, you know, there's like all sorts of stuff. So, but, you know, but she had to figure it out in the sense, like they kept her in the hotel close by. She went there, she took the bus and then she kind of got panicked in the border because they called. It's all in Spanish. She had to fill this form to, you know, go through the border and all that anyway. But the point, what I'm saying is this is just one example, but she had a lot of experience. So, so did my son as far as this travel and kind of managing and things like that. So, you know, we we knew it kind of when they were 16, if something happened to us, say like we both like, you know, died all of a sudden, we knew that, no, I'm just saying that we knew yeah. that they would, they would be probably a little bit better prepared than kind of managing themselves because they were exposed to some of these, right? Now on the flip side, if something went bad, you know, I would probably be on CNN, you know, <laughs> with the father of the year in a wrong way. 
but yeah but 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 it did give them a lot of life exposure in those so so itf tournaments i think gives that you know that kind of the, the, the cultural exposure that normally you'd not get i have to ask you how did you prepare maya to be left by herself in a country where she doesn't speak the language to manage not only getting herself mentally and physically prepared to compete, which is a lot, of, it's a big ask for a 15 year old, but then also to navigate herself from one city, well, one country to another country alone, again, where she doesn't speak the language. Like, what do you do to help a kid understand what it requires to do that and and to be able to, and and for you to have the faith that she's okay, she can handle this. So, you know, so this was not planned. So the planning initially was not like she's by herself, right? So the yeah. planning was she goes with a group and she's traveling, right? right? It so happened that majority of the people had to sign in and the coach had to leave. So that was a decision that was made on the spot by the coach. Now they talked to me after the decision, but there was not a whole lot I could, there was not enough time for me to just like rush out because sure. you know you I knew about it Friday evening when they, it was told to me and the match is Saturday morning and then she leaves Sunday, right? Like, so it was right. not like, or Saturday night, whatever, you know, she was trying to look for tickets. Uh, but Maya felt pretty comfortable from what I understand. Like she was not, if she was completely panicked, then it would have been a different scenario. You know, in the flip side, like also when you go to these tournaments and all that, you're staying in these hotels where they know the coaches, the travel coaches. So the hotel where Maya was staying, you know, they knew brand. So they said that they would help. Like, you know, now I don't know what degree the help they would have done if something went south. But, yeah. you know, luckily nothing did and it, it it worked out. But what I'm saying is what is so astonishing for you if you look at the ITF world, it's not astonishing at all. You know, like it's so common for sure. other players. Like I was, I've gone to some countries and I have friends there from before. Like with my son, we went to Pakistan. You know, he played an ITF there. We went there and I have really good friends. And I met these two kids that were, that were at that time that were like 15, maybe at the same age, 15, 16. And one is from Russia and the other is from Iran. And these guys were good players. I mean, you know, I mean, if you look at purely UTR level at that age, they were 11, some UTR, but they were they were traveling seven weeks in countries by themselves, no parents. And when I asked them, one of them said, my parents don't even have a passport. So, you know, it's a whole different world. They get funded yeah. somehow. So those kids, they may not be great players, but those are the kids like, you know, when they're good, they you know, they come in and good college sports because they're pretty self-sufficient and they know what they want, you know? So these guys were like, I mean, I don't know if those guys are going to be like some phenomenal freaks later, but they definitely knew how to navigate, you know, and at that time, the you know, it was just post COVID. So there was a lot of restrictions with all the, right. uh, you know, the tests being taken and all that. I mean, it was a pain. I mean, you know, and then, uh, I mean, I was like blown away how they, they, they these guys were like managing all of that. Yeah. That's a lot. And I mean, it it goes in support of what I say all the time, which is, you know, tennis is teaching life skills to these kids. I mean, forget right. about the tennis skills. Your kids through these travel experiences and these two boys that you're referencing, they've learned how to navigate airports. They've learned how to navigate hotels, how to deal with changing reservations and dealing yeah. in languages that they're not familiar with, currency they're not familiar with. And these are skills that serve them, you know, the rest of their lives. I mean, they are sure. self-sufficient, yeah. competent human beings out in the world, which is what we all want for our kids. But sure. that said, I would have been terrified if I had gotten the phone call saying, oh, by the way, dad, 15 year old daughter here I'm being left in a hotel by myself while my coach takes the rest of the group to another country and I'm gonna have to figure out how to get to my match tomorrow win it recover and figure out how to get to the next country all alone right. yeah I think yeah. I would have been in panic mode so I don't know how you manage that and how your wife manages that but if you have a secret to share please <laughs> share it with the rest of us no, I mean, you know, some of it is probably like, I mean, again, you know, like 
I mean, if some something works out great, people say, wow, what they did it. But if something <laughs> bad happened, then we'd probably all be like regretting for the rest of the life. But no, I mean, you know, yeah. it's not it's not as bad as it sounds, right? Like, because when you're going in this, you have to realize like in a lot of these tournaments in the ITF junior tournaments, you know, the parent traveling, like I was traveling and I was also traveling as a travel coach with her. So it's a little bit different, but just a parent traveling is not super common you know it's i mean yeah. it is common but it's not like as especially as you so there's a coach coming or there's like the players traveling by themselves that's that's not very uncommon in right. when you go outside the us and you're traveling you know in yeah. the us it makes it a little bit difficult to do that also because you know you can't really go get a hotel by yourself till right. you're 21 you know right even if you're 18 you can i mean you can rent a car you cannot really go without a car so there's a lot of those challenges that that are there where a parent has to be there in the U.S., but outside, that's not the case. So you mentioned, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. You mentioned that you were the traveling coach for a bit. Talk about the challenges of being the parent slash coach and how you kind of navigated through that yourself, how your kids have navigated through that and what your relationship is now that they're done with junior tennis for the most part and heading off to college in the fall. So I, okay, so I'll be very honest with you on this, right? So I have not found a easy way that it's all great. And I'll share some personal stuff. So my son, you know, for two reasons. So when he was around 14 or so, he was playing, he was not getting as much success and he was training and he was training with Taylor Dent's Academy, but he was also traveling doing that. And so it's kind of like, you know, we were butting heads a lot, right? To the point where we thought that, okay, it's just it's not going to work, right? So he sort of stopped playing a little bit or traveling with me. And I kind of like, you know, completely laid off the coaching. And I thought for a while that this is like really bad, right? So about two to two years, I mean, the relationship is fantastic now, but it took him some time, like, you know, for him to go out on his own, kind of like outside of me and figure himself out, right? And he has done great in different ways. I mean, you know, he's going to do ROTC and, you know, D1 and the game, but he kind of took control of his own life per se, right? Like, so we rarely like, I mean, you know, like he stays in the house, but for the one year when he started driving, it's almost like, like a roommate. I mean, he goes and he does stuff and he, but he's like a, but for him, it worked out great. I mean, through this transformation, it's almost like, I mean, he's like, you go to his room in the morning and you, I mean, you know, five, six, six, six o'clock, the bed's made, he's doing his push up. So that now he may not be a tennis player, but in life, if he can continue this, it's good, you know? With right. my daughter, she was playing a lot of these bigger events. Now, I could not really, at, at some point, you know, like when you're playing the lower levels in ITF, it's easier to find group coaching. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you have like all these guys from different places that kind of assemble a lot of kids that's not their players, but they take them uh, like, you know, uh, and to, 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 to tournaments. But once you start playing the 200s and all that, it's really different because now you have, there are really better players coming, but now also you have one or two coaches that bring like some players. They come mm -hmm. with private coaches. Very few times there are some parents, primarily only Americans, like a lot of times they travel with parents, but then outside. But if you if you get a coach for those tournaments, I mean, they're not cheap. I mean, you know, now you're looking at pretty expensive. So I have a software company. So I was able to do some work, right? Like while I'm traveling and I'm not paying myself for my time. So it worked out because when you are traveling in these things, you do need some coaching help just to kind of like, you know, get them ready, make sure that, you know, they have the massage, right? Like right after the match, like they're signing up for the massage because there's only so many slots, right? And you, you know, you're warming them up. But I would not say that the journey with Maya traveling has been so phenomenal. I mean, I think like, you know, I mean, because, you know, uh, I mean, you know, uh, Lisa, you know, you know, I, you know, I, my, my other software passion that I'm building now is the accountability partner, but that's like, right. with, you know, with tennis wizard, but that's like somebody else kind of guiding, being accountable, something, but if a dad's an accountability partner, who's like nagging you every day, I mean, it's not a great situation for anybody. So I would not suggest if people can afford a coach that they trust, who can take them forward. That's always the best option. The reality is it doesn't happen a lot. And then you do it what you can you know, and then you almost take it to the point of where it's like breaking, but it doesn't break. And then you sort of back out. And I've seen this happen over and over. It's not like just my story. I've talked to right. several coaches like outside, like, you know, like 
like all over the world who have done this at different level, right? Like, you know, like, you know, success is all relative, right? So I've seen like, um, and, and some do it better than the other, of course, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, you talk about the, the money and being able to afford these things. Let's talk budget for a minute. If, if your kid is on the ITF pathway, what are we looking at in terms of annual budget? Yeah, so, so it depends. So again, you know, I put some comments there and I think I got a lot of comments and then it kind of went out. So I'll tell you kind of like, I'll, I'll tell you the whole section on the kind of the budget, right? So if you're doing it yourself, right, you just take a kid and you go and you're trying to cut corners and be cheap as possible, right? If you are traveling from the US and you're going to South and Central America, mainly Central America, like the Mexico and Guatemala and Honduras, El Salvador and all that. And and let me just interrupt. The reason you're saying that part of the world is because they tend to have clusters of these ITF tournaments where you can take a few weeks and go and play several events back to back, right? Yeah, primarily all the ITFs are, you know, everywhere they do clusters. Mm -hmm. So if they don't do it at the same location, they do it in the same general geographic area. So you can, you can, you can string along, you know, at least two to three events, you know? Right. Um, But so on those weeks, if somebody just taking them and then the budget, like if they want to stay in an Airbnb in Central America or something like that, right? Those Airbnbs, you can get really good Airbnbs, you know, for about 45, 50 bucks like a day. And then Mm -hmm. say you're, you're, you know, you're being quite cheap and you're cooking and whatever, you're spending another budgeting, another 50 bucks for the meal and local transportation. So about hundred a day, that's like, so like now if you do it for seven, eight days or seven days, so that's 700 and then your flight. So the flight varies, but if you buy it early, especially if you fly, I found like if you're flying from South Florida, like from Fort Lauderdale area, you can get really cheap flights, right? So like example, like if I'm going from Dallas and I'm, I was flying to Guatemala, you know, the round trip could be 650, 700 bucks, but then I could take a flight to Fort Lauderdale and you can buy those early and all that. And then from Fort Lauderdale to Guatemala or something, you can get it for, sometimes you can get it for hundred bucks. Wow. Like, right, right. Like really cheap. So if you budget about, I, in my experience, I would say if one is doing it themselves without a coach and they're mm-hmm. just willing to kind of, you know, you know, do it a little bit the hard way, uh, probably about thousand to 1500 bucks a week is a good budget. Okay. They should they, in these tournaments, the Central America ones, right? Yeah. If you go to South America, the cost is just about the same. The local cost, the flights are a little bit more expensive, except Colombia, right? Colombia flying from Port Lauderdale is, is not expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And then if you're going, if you're doing the European swing, the flights are even more and the day to day costs are going to be higher. Europe gets, Europe can get very expensive, especially for yeah. Americans, you know, and I'll tell you why. There are some things that I don't. I mean, I, I, or I have not compromised with Maya. So we always try to get a place. It's either own room or our own apartment or something, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of these players that are playing tennis Europe, they also like when they are paying themselves, they stay in hostels. Now those hostels are very cheap, but you know, it comes with its own challenges, right? Like, I mean, it's like shared bathrooms and, you know, you don't know who else is staying in the room and the guy's partying at like 10.30, going yeah. out at like coming back at two in the morning. So you cannot really do it, but I've seen people do it, right? Like, you know, who are really trying to shoestring it. Europe obviously gets expensive much more than traveling in Central and South America, right? Yeah. If you don't have a base, if you have a local base and you you have a setup, right? In one of these places to go and base yourself, then it, then it works, right? But then the player also has to be willing to go and go for like months at a time. When you say a base, what are you talking about? Yeah. So all the, a lot of these clubs and academies in Europe, so it's very common, right? Like, so for example, if you look at the Asians when they travel, right? Like, like, you know, they are pretty well structured, like, and by Asians, I mean, like say the Koreans or the Chinese. And then we can talk about the sponsorship part, how they fund it a little bit different these countries. So what they do is if they're going to play on clay, they don't just show up. There's a J200 in, you know, in Germany, and I'm just going to show up three days before. What they do is they do a preseason always in this thing. So they have a base. Where do they go for the base? There's different clubs and academies. They do a base and then they go rent a place there. So they will go there, they train, 
and then they take the train or they drive and then they play the tournament. But when they lose, they right away, they come back to that base and they're training there. So that kind of becomes their training block or the training base. So that's a very common model, uh, you know, how people travel when they're going overseas. Got it. Got it. Okay. And, and let's talk about these funding options. Let's talk about sponsors and federation funding and anything else that you've learned. Yeah. So if I, you know, so there are three types and I learned, I, I was, although I played tennis and I played college and all that stuff, Lisa, I was completely, I had that whole thing. I had no idea really. Right. And in Dallas, I really did not know anybody that were doing it right so if you mm -hmm. you know and then generally people are not very and, and the people who do it it's not like it's common knowledge they're going and sharing the experiences and do it so exactly you know, what i found was three times and now i met a lot of these agents and people and i understand how they do it so three times in a player's life that the agents look at okay so one you see they do it when they're really young the kid that are like seven eight years old and nowadays i mean if you go on to instagram you're going to see a lot of these prodigies that are putting a lot of social media right so their only yeah. purpose is they are trying to attract attention you know get the likes so these agents you know they look for it it's almost like they come to you you don't go to them you know mm -hmm. but they have also become smarter over the years so they have realized like 95 percent 98 percent probably of those prodigies don't pan out because at the end of the day when these agents are putting money it's a business they are not doing it because of the good of their heart. They want to help it. So I, I mean, it's, it, this was fascinating when I learned, right? So they pick up those, but they give them some kind of a seed funding. They used to give a lot of funding at that time. Like if you look at 10, 15 years back, um, I forget that girl's name, like this is a Russian girl. She actually ended up teaching in Brookhaven for a while. And then, you know, but at one point they thought she was going to be like Sharapova. I cannot recall her name. But, you know, there was a lot of story around it, right? So anyway, she apparently got like seven figures when she was super young. It didn't pan out, right, for her. And then, you know, it sort of, for a variety of reasons, it went uh, Shishkina or something. I forget the name. Like she's, she's American, but she was Russian. But it went in a whole different way. But nowadays, I don't, what I understand is they don't give them a lot. What they give them is they'll give them like, you know, they'll get you a racket contract, maybe a clothing contract, and they'll give you maybe 10 grand, something to just kind of, you know, seed funded to see it, right? And mm -hmm. and then what do you do? And then the second phase where they do look, where it's kind of a development phase, where they start getting some serious money is when they're around 12. Mm -hmm. So if they're 12, if they're having really good results in like a big tier tournament, like, so for example, like Orange Ball is a good one, yep. you know, or if they look at Tennis Europe, right? Like if you look at the Tennis Europe Masters or some key Tennis Europe events you're playing in Barcelona, a lot of it is access. Those tournaments, these agents know, they are there. These these guys are not showing up, you know, in an L2 in Oklahoma City, you know, so then you have no chance of getting seen by these people, right? Like Orange Ball, some, not a lot. In Europe, in TA, you know, uh, the Tennis Europe events, yes. But it's not just also, what I understand, it's not just also like if the guy is just winning the tournament, okay? Because what they look at is they look at the background of the player, who the family is, you know, how far are they willing to go? Now I know some agents who have talked to me. So they look at, like a lot of them told me that typically, like although there's a lot of good Indian kids come up, they don't traditionally throw a lot of money because they always feel that, again, you know, I'm, I guess, mm -hmm. stereotyping, but um, a lot of the Indians don't completely forego education. So right. they will always know that they will, you know, continue with the study and when things go south in this or it's not going as well, which it's going to eventually happen at one point or the other, uh, that becomes the other thing becomes very attractive, right? The college tennis and, you know, going and, you know, doing this. So so typically they also try to look at the genes of the players, like how tall they are, you know, like the background, if the parent is an active coach and then the game style is the kid like really a big hitter, right? Can they really handle it? Because what's winning in 12s, you know, doesn't win. Right. When it really matters. Right. So they kind of like look at those. So they make a combination decision also like who vouches for you. So it's not a straightforward thing. It's a little bit murky. But then at that 12, that's when they put a little bit more serious cash. OK, so that's when they typically put around 80,000 a year for about four years. Wow. Yeah. So that's and they a give you model consistent. Huh? They give you four years to kind of come good and. Yeah. And then, I mean, how are the agents 
why are they doing this? What are what's because they, the because upside they for them? them? So they get when they do it. So there's always an upside built into the contract, right? Like, so if you make like, if you make, so this called triggers. So if you make certain cuts, you know, you're top 10 in the world and you, you get this much more money, but we get back this much percentage, right? So, but this also, it's a little bit like buying equity in a player. When these guys sign this, a lot of times they also take that. And then there's another phase of funding that comes around 17 years old. So at that time, now you're looking at, are these guys making a really big dent? like in the in the higher level right like are they are they you know are they winning slams are they are they going in like you know the junior slams are they going deep in challengers so that that's when another serious level of funding comes in to kind of seed you through to that to the transition phase to the top 100 ATP or WTA you know but um but that 12 13 that phase is important because they fund you so you can go train in the right places, right? Because you, you know, I mean, you, there are only so many places you can go and you have to be in those right locales and, you know, the relocation and the cost and all that. So they, but, but that's, uh, I mean, you can do it. Obviously there's many stories that you don't need that you can do it outside, right? Like Ben Shelton's are like a phenomenal example, yeah. but, but, but this is also not very uncommon that you get that funding at that stage. This is from agents. And there is a whole separate way how the funding happens with the federations and with private companies that are not agent based in Asia. Okay. And I mean, talk about that. Talk about these players coming from these other countries and yeah. how they're paying for this tennis. Yeah. So if you look at like, so for example, if you look at like, and I've been to this country. So if you look at like, say, say Korea, right? Like South Korea, South Korea has a very robust, inf like a, you know, they may not have that many players, but the funding structure is very well defined. So they have all these about 10 large corporates. And I'm talking about the, the large South Korean companies, right? So that are there. They have dedicated fund because sports is very important for them. Mm -hmm. You know, so in like, for example, in Dallas, if you have under 14 match going on, you know, I'm a member at Brookhaven Country Club and they have under 14 tournament and it's hot. The members are not going to go and watch that match. They would rather go sit inside and then watch their friends play doubles, right? Yeah. But the culture of sports is different in those. So there's a lot of pride in playing these junior tournaments and supporting. So these guys support, like there's a company called Orion. So they have a team Orion, you know, Hung Taik Lee, who was a former pro. Hung Taik Lee is one of the travel coaches, right? Like, so, you know, and then, uh, you know, and then and then there was another guy who played Davis Cup before called Kim Bong Su. He, he was also part of it. He's not there anymore. But they have this guy. So this is Team Orion will like say sponsor like 20 kids. Okay. And when I say sponsor, they take care of them, right? Like from training to travel to physios. I mean, you know, they 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 do the best they can. And then, but Team Orion is one, but there's also other companies like that in Korea that do it. So Japan has a similar model. So the Federation is kind of inactive. They don't really participate. They don't put that much cash in. Japan, the same thing. The Federation supports a little bit young, but once they are like 14 and so that, that's why you see a lot of good Japanese players at IMG, right? Like, I mean, you know, in, in, in the US, but a lot of them are funded by private companies and, you know, when they send to IMG, it's a little bit different. It's not like they're sending them to IMG to coach. They have, they have a coach that comes with them, like what they did with Nishikori. So that's a, it's a common misconception that people think I send them to an academy. So, you know, in this large academies, when I've been there, so there's, you have the model where people are paying, they're funding the academy infrastructure. You come in, you're paying full and you're funding it. And then you have the special cases who are, Putting, who are paying the academy money, but they're all funded, but they have a point of contact, a liaison, a coach or a manager, somebody that's staying with them from their country that's there. And that's basically their only focus is that player. So they're using the infrastructure, they're using the coaching advice, advisory and all that, but this person is working as a project manager. That is super, super prevalent right now. Okay, So this is, this is very common. And then you have the pure federation place, right? Tennis Australia is a very good example. So Tennis Australia mm -hmm. has a very well defined program, right? In Brisbane, they, you know, they have a they have a setup. They support as many people as they can. I mean, you know, recently you probably know Maya Joint, you know, who's American. Her, you know, yeah. her dad is Australian. She switched nationalities, and the and and her her graph has like taken off, right? She's inside top, you know, one eighty or something right now. WTA, you know, but they but their support. I know some of the coaches. They're very good coaches, but that you have to be Australian. You have to be kind of part of the program, fit in, you know, in their model, and 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 then they have different routes for different players. So China has the same thing. It's more provincial. 
not a Chinese federation, but then different, you know, Chinese provinces support the players. China is a little bit weird because they don't, they could care less for juniors and traveling and all that because they only want people that can play for China, play Olympics, play nationally. So they fund them, they play a lo lot local, but mm -hmm. they support significantly. And then they pay the, you know, they pay the parents some money in China. When they take these kids away, they're actually, they pay the parents like because they're taking the kid away. So they provide it's a little bit weird that the dynamic. You know, when I was in Beijing, I was blown away like the model and some are really, really good players. But they are like, you know, I mean, if you really look at their, their true UTR, probably a lot of those girls would be at least 10 plus who are like 16 years wow. old, but they never leave China because they're only trying to go straight through. And if they can make pro, they, a lot of them don't go to college also because they don't really follow the education system and they, they could care less because they know that they can go back to a good Chinese university and then put that focus on studies, you know? Interesting. Um, the other one, the funding now, what's happening is there is one uh, group that's doing a really, really good job, um, you know, is, and, you, and, you know, it's called TEC Carlos Ferrar Salat. So this is a very rich, uh, uh, they're in biomedical like this guy called Carlos Ferrar, he's, he's from Spain. And he created this academy, you know, called in Barcelona, TEC, Carlos Ferrar Salat. They don't charge anybody. They got, Kathleen Covado is, you know, who's, who's American is actually there. They sponsor like about 80 kids at different age groups, but they're primarily all Spanish kids. I think there's a one or two like Russians and stuff there that are from, that lived in Spain and all that, but but they take care of that. And I, I have I have run into them in the J500 in Osaka, in Australian Open, Wimbledon, like these big events. And they also support all the way through pro. Now that's a huge thing if you look at it, because now you, it's not a mass system and these coaches are very good. They're like top, you know, three, 400 ATP players. They got physio, they got food, they got everything covered. And the guy's just doing it because of the good of his heart, right? Because he wants to improve tennis. So, wow. you know, these are, so these are, so these are some of the ways that are, that you see the global funding model, you know, where, how it works, you know. But for an American family that has a kid that wants to get as good as they can get, how would they get into one of these academies overseas? So American families also, they, they do it in a little bit different way. There's a couple, right? So one is, you know, like, look, that's why I'm saying like somebody, either the parent himself or herself or they have an uncle or somebody very close to them where it's not a direct monetary relationship. They work with the kids a lot in the early stages to get them good, you know? Mm -hmm. And then in the US, you see kind of two models. So you have a lot of good players that come out of Southern Cal. A lot of them don't even play the full USTS circuit, as you know, right? They're yep. playing in the West Coast, but, you know, they're in Orange County, they're in LA, like, you know, some in San Diego, but they have a good system where the local play is pretty good. And then you, you don't see them in juniors. You don't see them playing the slams, junior slams, but suddenly one or two, you will see them suddenly they're like, wow, they're kind of like, really high UTR, high college, and then they're going to the pro, right? That's that That's that one model. USTA PD helps, you know, a little bit, but very, very selective. And, you know, they have, like, if you are really, really good early on and they do it, but I have not found, and I've been a USTA volunteer and been that there is really a very clear defined model that's published that everybody knows I do all of this, I qualify, you know, so I yeah. don't think I have ever seen one, right? So <laughs> now there are, there, there are players that have, been part of the USDA PD where they trained for years in Lake Nona, right? Like, you know, like right. if you look at the, the last few years, I mean, I can sit here and name probably about seven, eight players. I mean, you know, with different levels that they did. Uh, as far as their funding, like, you know, to the tournament, I think sometimes they fund, sometimes they don't. There's also like, if you're part of an NJTL chapter, right? Like if you're part of the foundation, any of those, like, you know, the foundation also helps out some, right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. In in, uh, in 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 cases, you know, like you know, Maya and Jay have been part of, you know, they have volunteered, they've been part of NJTL, and they have got not, not nothing like the amounts that we are talking about those, but you know, like you know, we'll, we'll we'll cover a little bit here, we'll cover a little bit there. So so they help, but the, the help that the US players get is not like it's not super defined and super organized. It's pretty much the parents doing it themselves with whatever they can. You know, um, that's what I've seen. Yeah. I want to shift to college and college recruiting for a minute because I can't believe we're, we're already almost at an hour. It's just crazy. Um, you have a son, you have a daughter, they're both going to play college. I would love to hear how they got recruited 
and how they made their decision of where to commit to go play next year. So, you know, for Maya, it's a little bit different because, I mean, obviously she's, um, you know, she she had a, you know, decent junior career. She reached top 100 juniors in the world, right? And, and she played a couple slams. So she was being recruited by every team. Um, you know, she visited Boise really early, like probably about three years back. And then, you know, the uh, she really connected with Boise at that time, like the place where she saw and the staff. And, you know, there was also like some other things as you know now it's not just straight scholarships you know that you can you can work your own package with an IL and all that so for her it worked out without getting into the details it worked out good for her for my son it's been very very different because for a period of time when I was saying that he was around 14 or so like when I was kind of like you know that really when you need to kind of like go double down we're kind of losing him and we figured that if we really push super hard so he wasn't really doing a whole lot at that time, like not really playing UST and not really playing ITF, kind of just like there. But the good thing is he really would like to work out. So he was doing a lot of fitness. He was training locally and all that, right? Mm -hmm. He kind of, he made a call that he wanted to go to the military, you know, so he really like through his own reading or whatnot, right? So he was looking at the military schools, but then he, he kind of himself decided that he also wants to have that option, right? Where he can do ROTC. But if he doesn't want to serve, he doesn't need to serve. So he was looking, you know, he was very close. I mean, you know, he was talking to West Point and he was talking to like, you know, um, Naval Academy. And then he was also talking to um, uh, Coast Guard. Yeah, so right, Coast so he went to the camps and all that. But, but then he made a call with ROTC. So then he looked at different schools. And for him, he's going to a mid-tier school. You know, the Indiana, which used to be called IUPUI, Indiana University. Now it's called Indiana University at Indiana. So they're a mid-tier D1 school. He'll play in the lineup. You know, I mean, he's not paying because, you know, I mean, he's got scholarships. So for him, it was more self-driven than hers. She was pretty heavily recruited by, you know, a variety of colleges. And what did he have to do to get recruited by Indiana? Did he did he reach out to the coaches? Did he send video? I mean, I, I you know, there's this fallacy out there that if your kid is a good tennis player, that the coaches are going to just come in swarms, you know, as of June 15th of that summer before junior year and, and the offers are just going to pour in. And and that's just not the reality, especially for boys. No, it is absolutely not. And for him, so he had to do the legwork, which we're really proud that he did. You know, he uh, went and talked to a variety of universities and colleges, but he had it in his mind what he was looking for. He really, for whatever reason, he really wanted to play D1, right? But again, you know, like, as you know, in tennis, the levels for D1 and D2, it is not like, you know, you're playing a La Liga league, right? So you could have yeah. an NAIA college, which is phenomenal, like a Georgia Gunet, right? Like, you know, right. and uh, so, but anyway, he wanted to play D1. So he kind of looked at, I mean, he did his own mapping, right? Like, you know, sort of where he stands with his level and where he can fit in and, and all of that. But then it comes down to how persistent you are with the coaches. So if you are really persistent and you're showing them that you're kind of trying to figure out your finances and you're not completely dependent on paying for your school things like that you know and then you have good references from travel coaches like you know and your ex coaches and all that i mean you will definitely find a slot right i mean there is a slot for everybody but a lot of people don't want to do that work up front right like now if you're good and you are like you know you're playing the junior slams and you're doing all of these things you will get a lot of calls right it may not be the way you want to really go i mean you know i mean but you will right. get similar ones right like you know like so that work is a lot less because they are sort of chasing you. And then now you're trying to just negotiate your NIL and do all of that, right? So it's a little bit different on your level. But if somebody wants to play, and even if they're like a three-star athlete or whatever, I mean, you know, they're like a 10 UTR. I mean, they have a home. I mean, it's just like they need to just work at it to get it. It's like getting a job. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I, I love hearing you echo the message that, that I say all the time. Yeah. And and the experience of going through that is so valuable yeah. for these kids. I mean, it doesn't matter what you do in life. If you're good at marketing and marketing yeah. yourself, which is what the recruiting process is, it's going to serve you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Um. Okay. We are really at the end of our hour, but I want—I don't want to have you leave without talking about Tennis Wizard. So, 
Can you tell us a little bit about Tennis Wizard, why you decided to start it? And we're going to do a follow-up episode and really dig into it. Yeah, I mean, you know, so this is a passion project, right? Like this is like, you know, like we have a software company, like parenting so we, aces. <laughs> yeah. So we have a we have a software company. So we built we build this and, and I have some contracts with some federations. We started this overseas. So basically what it does is, you know, when these kids go through this journey, right? Like every day, like, you know, what I found was really needed from a mental health standpoint is if somebody is staying as an accountability partner, help them goal set, structure kind of the day, their day, what's important, help them periodize for tennis you know, um, the tournament planning, like those things, but somebody that's knowledgeable, that's doing it, but they're doing it consistently every day, you know, at a, at a low price point, which is hard to find. I have an offshore team, so we kind of trained them. They came from counseling background, a lot of them. We trained them in this and we started doing pilots about a year back, right? So we work with a bunch of players and now we are kind of like, you know, doing some stuff locally in Dallas and 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 and, and trying to grow it. So basically we be the accountability partner for the for the child as they progress through the journey for their tennis and for academics, right? And while we're doing it, we do a wellness check. And if they have issues, like for example, like things like, you know, confidence, concentration, you know, we have some experts on the back, we provide them this it, 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 and, and, you know, it doesn't replace their coaches. We don't do any technical work. We are kind of like an extension of their coaching team, just follow up what the coaches are working, things like that. So yeah, like we're pretty excited. So this is kind of my project, like, you know, going forward once the kids leave and, and yeah. That's awesome. Um, and if people want information on Tennis Wizard, is there a website now or where can yeah, they get yeah, they information? Yeah, yeah, they can go to the tenniswizard.com. I mean, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, there is the website, you know, I'll, I'll pass you my, uh, my, my, my number. And then the other thing on the Tennis Wizard, what we do a lot is we do what we call it as light college consultants. We, we, we had 80 kids that go to college that have used this, right? But they can't afford the US, you know, the large consulting companies that are paying five grand but they can pay, you know, 40 bucks or whatever, right? Like a month, you know? Yeah. So we give them the just-in-time guidance about, you know, here's the draft letter you can use. Here's your mapping, you know, where it is. So it helps the the lower two-star, three-star athletes to kind of have a pathway and have a clear idea about college, you know? I love that. We'll have those links in the show notes on parentingaces.com. So be sure and check sure. those out. Anurban, it's been such a pleasure to speak with you, and I know you have so much more knowledge to share, so we definitely have to do this again. And just a reminder, this all started because of a Facebook post that you made about yeah, your yeah, experience yeah. at Junior Wimbledon. And so if it's okay with you, I'm going to copy and paste that post into the show notes as well, because I think it was so chock full of value, and I want to make sure everybody has a chance to see that as well. Sure. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for having me. Very right. cool. To my listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. We will catch you next time on Parenting Aces.